Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Alexandraki, and I'm the Legal Regulatory and Compliance Officer of uh, LuxFlag. On behalf of LuxFlag, I would like to introduce the next session of the day, uh, hosted by Clifford Chance. The topic of the session is Sustainable Finance, uh, ESG Trends in Loans and Bonds. And uh, today with us, we have uh, Stephanie Ferring, a partner heading the global financial markets, uh, Lauren Harris, Council Incorporate, and Yolanda Gita Bluidescu, Senior Associate in Global Financial Market. The floor is yours. So, good afternoon. Welcome. Nice to see you. Um, there will uh, hopefully be some room for questions at the end, so don't hesitate to, to ask questions towards the end. So, today's presentation is really about um, market approaches to ESG issues and what we are seeing in the market on debt instruments in general. We will focus in particular on loans and bonds, which is what we most commonly see um, in the debt market. And, and there we will look at what we're seeing in terms of change in the contractual documentation, but also in the terms of processes which the creditors are undertaking as part of their due diligence exercise when they are providing funds to a company. Reporting obligations are also key when it comes to ESG, so we will also look into the requirements of the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive and what its impact is in Luxembourg. So that sets a bit the scene for the discussion today. So starting with the loans. As many of you will be aware, a few years ago, a set of principles and best practice guides were published by the Loan Market Association on green loans, sustainability-linked loans, and also social loans. Since then, they were also recently updated um, in order to reflect the market developments which arose over the years. The principles of the sustainability-linked loans, green loans, and also social loans um, they are really intended to be a voluntary set of recommended guidelines which are supposed to be used by the market players. They are all publicly available. Well, you have to register, but the, the registration is free, so you have to register on the public website um, of the Loan Market uh, Association, which is really the reference when you're looking at... Um, let's say, syndicated loan transactions to find a good um, balance between what the expectations of the lenders and the borrowers are in the lending market. Um, it is really on the side of the sustainability-linked loans that, that there have been the most developments over, um, over the years. In May this year, there were model provisions which were published by the LMA, which give an indication as to the drafting of those provisions and how the provisions should be drafted. Um, the aim is really to reflect the current market provision when it comes to those, um, the current market practice when it comes to those provisions, but also to protect the integrity um, of the sustainability-linked loan market and that there is really some sort of um, reference um, to which the parties can, can abide. And also, even more recently, earlier this month, so in the middle of October, the LMA also published a term sheet for sustainability-linked loans, which the parties can use when trying to document their loan documentation. So, my question, my first question then for Yolanda, although you might have got at the answer already from the fact that I've been talking mainly about the sustainability-linked loans, is um, what are you seeing in terms of trends um, when it comes to the, you know, to the ESG financing, which we, or to the sustainable financing, as we would call it more, more broadly? Well, thank you for the question and thank you for being here with us. So, indeed, there are three, let's say, three main categories of labeled products. We have green loans, social loans, and sustainability-linked loans, because the first two categories are more linked uh, to the use of proceeds. If you want, you need to have 
you know, green projects, uh, social projects. So we're seeing less of those, but because of the flexibility of the uh, sustainability linked loans, we have started to see more, more and more of them. So to be, to be fair, the idea of a sustainability linked loan has been around for years, but now you, the, the LMA is practically with its principles and with its model clause, it's getting, you know, getting to what the market has been doing for years. Uh, and as my colleague has said, they're not, they're not uh, mandatory, they're, they're, you can, but because it's a very reputable uh, organization, a lot of people follow them. And, you know, we still have to see because the model provisions are fairly new to the market. Um, there have been things that um, were, not, were not included in there, although sometimes they're used. Like, for example, you know, um, the, the key point about the sustainability linked loan is you get a higher margin if you don't meet your KPIs or your SPTs. So some, some lenders um, have thought, okay, fine, we don't want to win from the fact that you know, our borrower ends up not being so sustainable as they want to be. So let's maybe the surplus in margin, let's uh, maybe invest it in you know, uh, ESG uh, clauses, organizations. But this, you know, although it's a very nice initiative, has caused a lot of headaches because of uh, KYC, uh, you know, this and that. So it was not included in the model provisions. Uh, again, something that we have seen more and more is, uh, you know, under the, the principles, you have to have external review of your KPIs and your SPTs, which are, you know, are what you are being judged as to whether the margin goes up or down, or you get, you know, bonification from the fact that you are trying to move to a sustainable way of doing business. And what we've seen is, um, there now uh, more and more lenders are pushing the borrowers to um, actually have a pre-valuation, if you want, so not a valuation after uh, the fact. So, you know, a powerful borrower will push back on this. Uh, and, yeah, and, and also because of the principles and, uh, you know, the, the model clauses, which are very new, um, you know, when you have a refinancing of a sustainability linked loan or, uh, you know, borrowers which have had this in a while, it's harder to impose the more stringent provisions that have come over the years uh, to somebody who has already a loan like this and they can say, well, you know what, we've done this before, it has worked before, why, why are you pushing this on us now? Uh, another thing we've seen in practice is in relation to, you know, when you outperform or underperform on your KPIs, whether there is a discussion to be had, look, are we ambitious enough? Are, are they uh, good enough for us? Can we actually do this? So that is also a, a reason for amendment. And, uh, you know, we've seen... We've seen them happen, and uh, there's a, because there's a lot of flexibility. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I can. We, can, I think we can talk for hours on what we've seen and what we haven't seen, and what people are doing in the market, and uh, how leverage positions are, you know, sometimes harder to push than you know what we have in the investment grade. So yeah, this would be, you know, the the most of the you know the new things we've seen in this market. Yeah, I, I think even though the green loan principles were the ones which were developed first, in practice, because of the requirement to have the use of proceeds in the green loan, which needs to be clearly determined, we see really hardly any. It, it is really on the sustainability linked loans um, where we see developments in the loan documentation and where there are then certain representations and undertakings which, uh, which apply or also if some requirements are not met, there's very often uh, a, a step up in the, uh, in the margin. Did you want to add, to add something to that, or uh, maybe maybe to just to give uh, the you know just to give an idea of, of of what KPIs we're seeing, and you know how many. Uh, so on on the we we obviously have to see them from all the three 
uh, letters from the E, from the S, and from the G. Most of them are environmental, and the clear winner is uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions. Uh, then you have reducing waste. Uh, we've seen in one of them reducing the sugar in the drinks that they produce. Um, there's obviously people are getting more, you know, more uh, courageous about this, and they're they're saying they're they're actually. Uh, you know, going also on the social and also on the governance, so more transparent governance, um, more women in boards, uh, compliance with human rights. Uh, we've seen, uh, while initially a few years back, we've had just one, two KPIs. Now, it's, you know, more or less three KPIs, obviously with different weights for the STPs, but um, yeah. This is, this is, I think, uh, uh, the market is obviously evolving and it depends very much on the business that you're looking at. And this is the nice thing about this instrument. It's very flexible. And what, what happens when the KPIs, so the key performance indicators, are not met? Well, um, so uh, it, it uh, depends. But generally, uh, you, you get uh, requalified. So uh, it's no longer, uh, it's, it's you obviously your margin goes up, you have to pay for it, but then you get, uh, you get requalified as a you know, normal standard loan. And you know, this, uh, this leads to, it. so it's not an acceleration event, you don't have to pay it back. But the, the, the problem is, um, you know, and this is maybe a question for the panel that comes after us on, on, on uh, greenwashing, the problem is how you market, if you marketed that, if you said, look, we're doing a lot of sustainability linked loans, we're, we're, you know, you agree with the borrower, you do that. And then, you know, three months down the line or a year down the line, well, you know, mm, it didn't work out. We have to, de uh, you know, we have to declassify this as a, as a sustainable uh, loan. So, yeah, this is what um, generally happens. And I think um, what is important to note there is indeed that usually um, if the requirements are not, it is not under the sustainability linked loans, it is really not linked to an event of default. Um, I think uh, particularly at the moment, we, we see a lot of events of defaults happening more generally uh, due to the uh, current market uh, conditions. So um, I, I think this is an important feature also um, of the sustainability linked loans that it's not linked normally to the, to the events of default uh, as such. Now, um, y y Yolanda, what is the question you typically see from the, c the clients we are advising from? What is, the, what is the question which is most often uh, asked? So um, I think the question relates to the golden clause, uh, a clause to end all clauses. So now that you have to be shortly taxonomy, aligned rather than eligible everybody or you know everybody would like to include this uh, clause whereby the borrower says i will comply i will be taxonomy aligned no matter what happens but uh, you know this is very very hard if not unattainable because things have you know we we just had the yes uh, we just have this the csrd which will come you know which is enforced but will will strike like from next year so things are constantly changing and when you have a, a contract which is five ten years you can't even in under best endeavors you can't have I swear that I will be taxonomy aligned especially the problem here being uh, doing no significant harm and how you do that and uh, you know um, catering for all the due diligence on human rights and things like that so that is you know that is something that will probably we will probably have it in time when things are more established when we have the data when people know exactly what to do but probably n not for the next couple of years or so yeah that's going to be I interesting because for now, also, if you look at the, um, the principles which were published by the LMA, so in, in the annexes, they contain enumerations as what could be seen, you know, for green loans or what would be a good, um, a, 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 a good object for, for green financing or for sustainability linked loans. But there is no link in as of the moment w with the taxonomy. And there, I think, 
the expectation is probably that over time this this will certainly come, but it's a long way to it, it, it's a long way to to get there. And I think uh, Yolanda, you also uh, I mean we gave a feeling of what we see in the market, um, but I think you also had a question for the audience as to what they see uh, in terms of uh, in terms of loans. Well, yeah, how many lenders do we have here today? Raise your hand. Okay, so quite a few. Um, have you, on your side, been more, you know, given the green asset ratio uh, obligations that will, will probably, yeah, yeah, will come into force next year? Have you seen or have you have you tried to do? Okay, it will not be called a sustainability-linked loan, probably, but have you done it internally that you have loans that have, you know, um, clauses that that make loans greener, that incentivize somehow your borrowers to uh, become more sustainable? Or, you know, is it that it's business as usual and we come, uh, we, we will see what happens when, when it happens? <laughs> I'm from a Greek bank, hello. Uh, my name is Helen. Uh, it's a private bank in Luxembourg. We have inserted clauses in our contracts, and um, we have inserted environmental issues mainly. We're not in the green and the social yet, but uh, it's uh, regarding um, loans or financing we do to companies that may affect the environment in some way, and they have to do certain certifications before they can get financed. So we are already operating this way. So many thanks, Helen. Anybody else who wants to share their, um, their views? Well, uh, I can tell for private debt fund, so we have a little bit different regulations. Uh, uh, I think uh, we do quite a lot of uh, things regarding the uh, negative screening, so removing the certain sectors plus ESG ratios, the same as you said. We don't uh, label this as sustainability-linked loan, but uh, with many uh, borrowers use their uh, ESG ratios. But I think here the problem first uh, to justify that actually the ESG ratio is uh, sufficient enough to force any change, because sometimes when you have like, you know, 10, 15 beeps, it doesn't it doesn't prove that you actually move the needle with this type of uh, ratchet. And then, yeah, the, the biggest thing is uh, to, for example, to mark the private debt fund as an Article 8 fund, is to uh, to do this you know, taxonomy alignment, and then also to really show that we do this consistently for all borrowers, because sometimes it's really, it's, uh, it's not a standardized process. It's very dependent on, on the borrower and on each situation. Thank you so much. Yes, I mean, I, I think, you know, I think this is what we've seen as well. It's, it's not easy to find a one-size-fits-all. Some people have to market the funds indeed. We've seen the taxonomy question actually came in a, a fund, potential fund marketing uh, situation where, you know, you want to make sure that when you say, when you get the money and you say you're going to be green, you're still going to be green five years down the line. So this is uh, actually the problem. We've seen also um, some, some loans that have uh, you know, we're going to comply with the environment uh, and so on and so forth. And in, in those ones, uh, or we comply, then uh, you risk of, of, of triggering a misrepresentation if you don't. So, uh, you know, it's different ways of, of dealing with this. And uh, it's good to see that people, you know, are taking steps um, to, towards, you know, a more sustainable lending environment and investment environment. Thank you. Thank you, Landa. Now over to uh, Lauren. So um, what trends are you seeing from a capital market perspective? Um, sure, from a capital markets perspective and looking in particular at the bond market, um, this year has been really, let's say, evidenced by an orientation towards, or let's say a continued orientation towards a focus on defining the technical standards and also um, developing further the guidance with regard to um, information needed for bond issuers, investors, and also market players. And this is characterized by, for example, the ESMA 2024 um, working program, which was recently published. And um, 
this provides further information. It's a really useful tool. So if you haven't looked at it, it's, it's good to take a look. It's basically, it just sort of provides information concerning their goals, which have already been set, but reiterating them and then also pointing out the fact that they will provide um, certain information, for example, concerning um, their final report with regard to greenwashing. And then as well, also, um, ICMA recently provided their updated Q&As with regard to sustainability-linked bonds. And this is actually quite interesting in the fact that they have, this is an update versus the June 2022 version, but it really expands on information concerning the interplay between sustainably, sustainability linked bonds and loans, and then also um, providing further information with regard to how to measure the sustainability impact with regard to such bonds. And also it further develops with regard to the KPIs. And there it's interesting, there has been a certain amount of um, discussion with regard to the use of green CAPEX as a KPI. And within the um, Q&As, they actually mention the fact that um, green CAPEX can be used, but with a certain um, health warning as the fact that it's not actually, um, there isn't one solid definition with regard to green CAPEX itself. Um, but there's still a, a certain amount of development to be continued, but um, thus far, that's what we've really been seeing. It's this uh, continued adding more information and more guidance for, for issuers and, and investors. So everyone has already heard about the green bonds, which is really something which is regularly discussed, and there have been developments um, over the past uh, months as well. But um, Lauren, aside the green bonds, can you say us something more about the blue bonds, but also the orange bonds. <laughs> um, so blue bonds, this is actually a subset within green bonds. And they are, they're colored blue, you can imagine deals with water. It's um, SDG 14. So it's focusing on clean water and critical water resources, aquatic resources, maritime um, resources. And um, most recently, what's been seen is actually a use of blue bonds within the concept of the debt for nature swaps. So these were primarily, um, let's say, used oftentimes in, let's say, the 1980s, 1990s. And now it's, let's say, a new renovation of it. And it's being used now with an exchange of debt, existing debt, which is bought back and exchanged, refinanced in exchange for um, blue bonds, which are issued. This has been seen, for example, um, with Barbados that recently did this, and they actually partnered with um, the Nature Conservancy in order that they were able to receive a better interest, a better rate in regard to this, which really facilitated their ability to issue the bonds. This is, if I, um, let me just check, it's a 50 million USD bond that they had issued, and it's to cover about 30% of their water resources, um, of their coastline resources, my understanding, and then also to further develop their water conservancy. So it's really, it's, a, it's an interesting um, use of blue bonds and also, as mentioned, a renovation of, or a, um, let's say, a renaissance of what has been done previously. And then also, um, to tie back to what I was saying previously about the expansion of guidance and, um, let's say, the tools that are available for um, issuers and investors, is also there has recently been um, the ICMA Practitioner's Guide with regard to um, blue bonds has been um, published. And this also provides more information with regard to how to consider blue bonds, what would, what would fall within a category of, let's say, blue bonds, how actually to issue them, and provides further guidance. So it's, it's really, um, it's hopefully going to be a developing field. And then with regard to orange bonds, these as well, they aren't as, let's say, um, used as perhaps green bonds, sustainability, linked bonds, but they do have a, a place in the market. And um, actually, this just recently, our colleagues in um, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Tokyo were involved in the first issuance of orange bonds, um, involved with the um, Impact Investment Exchange, 
And this was tied to their uh, Women's Livelihood Bond series. And they have an initiative in which they are seeking to have a number of um, orange bonds issued over the next few years until 2030. Um, the look at the intention is to have about 10 billion USD um, in orange bonds. So it is, it is a growing market. It's going to hopefully have quite an impact. And the idea is also to empower at least well, the, the number that they're looking at is about 100 million women and girls should be affected by, by this initiative. That sounds uh, promising. Um, looking ahead, um, I mean, we all know that the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive um, has come into force and uh, will start to, to apply. It has a larger scope than the previous directive, which was the non-financial reporting directive. And now it's no longer called non-financial, but it's called <laughs> sustainability reporting. Um, so Lauren, um, uh, what do you see happening on, on that front and how does it um, affect companies? And does it affect a larger number of companies? Yeah, well, quite honestly, there's been really interesting recent developments. I think you, um, a number of you have probably seen that um, yesterday there was the vote with the European Parliament in which they considered a motion that had been put forward that potentially could have actually um, stymied the um, application of CSRD. There, this motion was actually put forward by quite a number of um, members of parliament in which they had considered that the um, ESRs potentially could, um, let's say, cause a a blockage to the development within the EU, and there was sort of a view that maybe there might have been some concerns that this would be additional added red tape that would not, um, let's say, facilitate growth. And um, depending on your views on it, but for those of us who are looking forward to CSRD, um, the, luckily, the parliament um, decided to reject that motion, and now it actually will go forward. It's, it's viewed that we will still be able to go forward with CSRD, and the application to approximately um, 50,000 companies as of um, January 2024. So it's really on the horizon. Um, within CSRD, uh, we've get, been getting a number of questions from clients about how exactly CSRD will apply to them, what the implications will be, um, whether or not it's going to apply just to a few of the companies within their structure, how exactly it, to view it within, let's say, the larger context. And that's brought up a number of questions as well with regard to how companies within multinational structures um, will deal with CSRD and the other disclosure requirements from other jurisdictions. So there is quite a, um, let's say, an uneven rollout of, with regard to disclosure requirements across um, Europe, the US, North America, more generally, APACs, and also um, the UK. There's not a, a harmonization um, in that regard. And so there's about a, quite a lot of back and forth as to how exactly to apply. One of the things that we've been recommending is that you look at what the strictest requirements are. And then hopefully, to a certain extent, if you look at the strictest requirements, so for example, CSRD versus um, some of the other disclosure requirements, you will hopefully be able to also comply with the less strict ones. But it's not a, let's say, um, a one case fits all sort of situation. And so this is where it's really crucial to build up the corporate governance within your structure to make sure that you have those methods to really provide a clear analysis of whether or not it applies to the particular entities within your structure, how exactly the disclosure requirements will apply, if maybe there might be a knock-on effect of perhaps applying at one level will impact the other level. So it's something where good, strong corporate governance will be necessary. Indeed. And last question from me, conscious of time. So worldwide, we have seen some pushback um, when it comes to ESG um, and also disclosures, especially in the US. Um, is this something maybe you can touch upon in a more European context? 
Sure. Um, I'll keep it really brief. Um, you'll see that there's been quite a lot of pushback um, on ESG in the US. There's been even the growth of the term green lash that's been um, used quite often. In the EU, there have been some situations where perhaps there might be a view that there's a growing concern with regard to a backlash to ESG, for example, in Poland. And then also there was a push in um, France and Belgium with regard to a pause with regard to regulatory um, uh, controls, let's say. But in general, there have been a number of studies and reports that have shown that actually uh, there still is a movement towards ESG, still a strong embracing of ESG. So it seems so far that the backlash hasn't really been embraced strongly in, in the Europe. And I think as well, seeing the vote that just recently took place in Parliament yesterday, it shows that there still is that, that passion and the um, support for, for ESG. Thank you, Yolanda. So we have 15 seconds left. So time for a quick question, if you're really quick. Um, I would love to hear your reflection on the EU green bond standards, because they tackle some of the issues on use of proceeds, taxonomy alignment, uh, pre-post issuance review. Is that something good? Look forward to? Um, I think that it is something that we that we need to be certainly a certain amount, um, let's say, cautious about, because it's the question is how exactly how clear it's going to be, how exactly one will really be able to apply. However, I do think that it is something that that will hopefully be a good a good measure forward. And but but again, as we've seen before, it seems as if something comes out and you still need to have additional guidance, additional clarifications, which probably will be the same situation here. No more questions. So thank you very much to Clifford Chance for this uh, session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.